Welcome back to Student of the Gun Radio. I am your host, Paul Markle, or should I say, soon-to-be award-winning Student of the Gun Radio. What do you think about that, Jared? Do you like that new title? I like that. It's kind of got a ring to it. (laughs) Soon-to-be award-winning Student of the Gun Radio. You guys have done a fantastic job. All of our fans out there, pat yourselves on the back. You're doing a great job. Uh, Our numbers are increasing every week, and we couldn't be happier and we're fa- we're very happy to be able to reach out to a newer uh, and a broader audience and deliver our message of peace, love, and hope. <laughs> uh, at the beginning, uh, you guys heard Madison Rising. Uh, Madison Rising is the official rock band of Student of the Gun. If you like Madison Rising music, if you like that rock and roll music at the beginning of our show, check them out at madisonrising.com, or you can watch uh, some of their videos. We use their material in our show material for Student of the Gun TV. And you can always go to studentofthegun.com to watch our shows every week. So they're up there. Also, we have an archives page. If you missed an episode of Student of the Gun TV, you can go to the archives and you can watch that. Well, I've got to tell you guys, uh, I'm coming to the microphone this week uh, with a bit of a heavy heart. Well, not just a bit of a heavy heart, a very heavy heart. Uh, yesterday morning as I record this, a uh, good friend of mine, uh, a man named Jay Guthrie. James was his official name, but nobody called him James. Everybody just called him Jay or Guthrie. Uh, he passed away unexpectedly. He was a relatively young man, and it was a shock to all of us, all of his friends, everybody in the uh, in the industry. If you're paying, if you've been paying attention to outdoor media, to the Sportsman's Channel, if you read Guns and Ammo or or Peterson Publications. You'll know Jay Guthrie's name. Jay uh, used to say that uh, he's just a good old boy who spends his time killing God's creatures, and he was lucky enough to get paid to write and talk about it. Uh, Jay was a a fantastic guy, and he was a good friend. I met him several years ago uh, when he and I went uh, coyote hunting. It was actually my first coyote hunt, and Jay was there. And I'm going to miss him. I just talked to him here a week ago. And everybody in the industry yesterday was just, they were just shocked uh, at the loss. So uh, we're going to dedicate this show to my good friend, Jay Guthrie. Now, obviously, you guys know if you're paying attention and if you're following us that uh, we've got a couple of fantastic sponsors that have made uh, this show possible. And one of them is Crossbreed Holsters of Republic, Missouri. I am wearing my Crossbreed right now, and I got a G19 in it. But I also have a Keltec uh, P380 and a pocket holster in my front left pocket. And Keltec Weapons of Cocoa, Florida is another one of our sponsors. Now, our bandwidth sponsor is Firearms Radio Network, and we are very pleased and happy to be a member of the Firearms Radio Network. If you guys are, you know, we've been doing a contest. We started, we kicked it off officially last week with our first Student of the Week award. And uh, our Student of the Week, his T-shirt, his official T-shirt is in the, according to my shipping department, it's in the mail and it's on its way to him right now. Jared is currently sporting his official Student of the Gun T-shirt. And we've got a Student of the Week and I'm going to turn it over to Jared. Jared, who is our Student of the Week this week? Well, Paul... Our student of the week this week is Mark Tolley, and he wants to know, what can we peasants do? How do we fight the increasing amount of ignorance in our legislatures that are banning things that they don't even understand? Mark, that's a good question, and I think a lot of people out there in the audience are are feeling the same way as you do or thinking the same thing. You're sitting out there in your living room, in your office, whatever, thinking, you know, I'm just this little tiny cog in this great big machine, and what can I do? Well, first of all, Pay attention to what's going on out there and pay attention to what your elected public servants, don't forget that, they're not the ruling class. They didn't become senators and congressmen to become your rulers. This isn't a old, merry old England where you have a peasant class and a ruling class. They're not. They work for you. You pay their salary. And you need to make sure that you let them know that. Hey, buddy, I pay your salary from my tax money. You are not the ruling class. You're not a duke or a duchess. So, uh, and write them, contact them. First of all, every, every major, 
uh, well, every politician, whether they're, you know, local or state or, you know, uh, if they're a U.S. Senate or U.S. representative, they have a web page. They have to, by law, actually have all their contact information up there. Uh, I would email them and I would call them. Now, when you call them, don't attack them on the phone and don't attack the poor girl who answers the phone for them because she doesn't actually cast the vote. It's not her fault that uh, your knucklehead representative just voted for the Gun Control Act or what have you. But let them know. Uh, tell them you want to leave a message for them. Write a letter. Write an, e- you know, send them an email. And the the big thing that that we have, or a big problem, I think we have as a nation, is we've been dumbed down to the point where we have the the attention span of a housefly. Most people have the attention span of a common housefly, and they're all angry today because their senator sold them out, betrayed them, went and voted for this gun control legislation, and then what what do they do in 18 months? You know, when it's time for that person to uh, be up for re-election again, or 12 months, or two years, or three years, that's why a lot of these senators get away with it. Uh, believe it or not, folks, senators know they can read a calendar, and they know if they're not up for re-election until 2018, that the vote that they cast today, you're probably not going to remember that vote in 2018 or 2016 or whenever it is. So they they pretty much feel like they're operating with uh, immunity, uh, and they can do just whatever they want to do whenever they want to do it. Don't let them get away with it. And if they do something that you believe is against your interest, against the interest of the citizen, you need to let them know. Make the phone calls. Send the emails. Now, where can you go to pay attention or where can you go to find out more information? Well, number one, I would go to the NRA's ILA or Institute for Legislative Action website, NRA ILA. There's a lot of different NRA sites out there, but the Institute for Legislative Action specifically focuses on pending legislation, current legislation, updates and upgrades in the laws, uh, which senators, which representatives are voting on, you know, which bills, what is hanging out there in the, uh, you know, what may come down the pike, what are they working on right now. They're very good at paying attention to not only national news, but state and local news, too. What is your you know state house and your state government? What have they got in, in store for you? And it's not always bad news. It's, you know, a lot of times it's, it's, uh, it's good news. For instance, in the state of Mississippi, the uh, concealed carry legislation that they passed many, many years ago had some kind of strange verbiage in it. And we talked about this a little bit on Student of the Gun Homeroom. But uh, the the verbiage said that the gun could be co- totally or it was like completely or partially concealed. And that qualified as being a concealed handgun. And people say, well, what does partially mean? If it's in a holster and two thirds of the gun is covered by a holster, does that mean it's technically concealed? Or if you can see the butt of the pistol, is it not? It was just weird verbiage. And so what the state did, the, the representatives, they went in and they just cleaned up the language. And rather than making it, you know, the kind of like that weird, uh, you know, I'm searching for a word now and it's not coming to me, but that's okay. Uh, they, they cleaned up the legislation. They took the weird verbiage out of it. And so on July 1st, Mississippi is going to become a, a legal open carry state. And, you know, things like that is what the NRA's ILA pays attention to, and they let you know. Uh, so that's what they're good for. And if, you, you know, if you want to donate money specifically to the IRA or I, the ILA, not the Irish Republican Army, the Institute for Legislative Action, you can earmark donations that go directly to the ILA to help fight for your rights right there. So uh, there is that. Now, as a kind of a part B or a part two to that question, you say, well, what can I do? Well, number one, pay attention, know what your senators are doing, uh, what your representatives are doing, and don't let them get away with it. You know, believe it or not, sometimes they listen. I know it seems like most of the time they don't, but sometimes they actually listen. And if they're so obstinate and stubborn that they don't want to listen, then it's time for them to go. Find another candidate who will support your positions or the positions of the American taxpayer, not the uh, positions of the American tax receiver, and, uh, you know, vote them out. Get get rid of them. 
And, and when someone's running for office, and this is a big thing, a lot of people, you know, folks, the reason we're in the, the pickle that we're in right now is because a lot of good people in America have said, well, I don't like politics, or I'm not interested in politics, or I'm not going to dirty my hands by paying attention to politics. Well, those who want to rule you are more than happy for you to not pay attention, because that's how we end up with things. To, Position we're in today is a direct result of good people, of citizens not doing their civic duty and paying attention to what the elected officials are doing. So pay attention. Now, what else can you do? You say, as an individual, you know, what else can I do? Well, number one, take control of your life. Take control of your wallet. Take control of where your money goes. And, you know, some of you might be thinking, well, what do you mean take control of where my money goes? Where do you spend? You know, you right now still have the freedom, for the most part, to spend your money as you see fit. If you are giving money to the enemy, to the people that want to disarm you, to the people that want to force you to buy government health care, the people that want to tax you into the poorhouse, If you're giving money to them or to people that support them, shame on you. You're tying the knot in your own noose. Stop doing it. Uh, People are like, well, you know, what what do you you mean? Well, I I think if you're listening to this show, you're probably aware of the black and white uh, crocodile tears video that all these uh, Hollywood wannabe celebrities and has-been celebrities put out after the Newtown shooting. Uh, we have to do something. It's time. It's time. It's time for what? It's time to disarm the American people so that only criminals in the government have guns. That's what it's time for. Well, those people put their faces on that video. You recognize them. Don't act like you don't. Stop giving them money. Well, it's not that easy. Yes, it is. It is that easy. Are you an adult or are you a six-year-old? What do you spend your money on? If you went to see Django Unchained and you gave Quentin Tarantino and what's the guy who I don't like, Jamie Scumbag, if you gave them your money, if you went to the theater and took your family to see that and you claim to be a pro-Second Amendment, pro-freedom type person, you're kidding yourself. You're fooling yourself because you're putting money into their pocket and then they're going on TV and in the magazines and wherever and they're talking about how you know, Barack Obama and the Congress and the Senate, they need to do something. They need to disarm the American people. And not only that, but they're ridiculous hypocrites. Uh, these Hollywood people that make their money playing with guns, and then they look at you out in the country and they say, well, you, you peasants shouldn't be allowed to have these dangerous, nasty guns. We need to disarm you. You don't need them. Only Hollywood elitists and government people need those. But you peasants certainly don't need them. I got a good one for you. Progressive insurance. Progressive is progressive. They're owned by a progressive liberal who donates millions of dollars every year to the campaigns of progressive liberal Democrats that want to enslave you. If you have progressive insurance and you're a gun owner, I don't even know what to ta- I don't even know what to say to you. Seriously. If you claim to be pro Second Amendment, pro Fourth Amendment, pro Fifth Amendment, if you kind of like that whole U.S. Constitution thing and you're giving money to progressive insurance, slap yourself. Okay, if you're in your house, walk over right now, walk over to the doorway. I want you to open the door. I want you to put your hand in the, on the door jam and I want you to slam it real hard. All right. Did you, that wake you up? Because if you keep giving money to progressive insurance and you want to keep your guns, you are a knucklehead. Stop doing it. Uh, uh, and this one's probably going to put a, a, uh, a thorn under some of your saddles. But you know what? Too bad. Somebody needs to say it. If you are a member of a labor union... That's right. I'm looking at you. If you're a member of an organized labor union and you are required to give them dues out of every paycheck, look me in the eye and tell me where those dues go to. Oh, no, 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 no. Where do they go to? 99.9% of all union dues go to liberal Democrat candidates. That's where they go. And those liberal Democrat candidates go to the, you know, the state capitals and the national capital. And what do they do? 
Well, they vote themselves pay raises. They vote against you, the citizen. Don't tell me that you are a dedicated American gun owner. You thump your chest. I'm an American gun owner, and I'm a patriot. And I gave $5,000 last year to my union, and they turned it right around and gave it to Harry Reid or Nancy Pelosi or whoever, whomever they gave it to, so they could go to Washington to vote away my rights. Stop doing it. Well, you don't understand, Paul. I have to. N- stop yourself. That's a cop out. Don't tell me you have to do anything. This is still the United States of America. You don't have to do it. You may choose to do it. You may do it because, well, it's convenient. Okay, I got you. But don't tell me how you support and love the Constitution and wrap yourself in the flag while at the same time donating money to liberal Democrat candidates. It just doesn't work that way. If if you're serious, if you are serious about being a patriot, about supporting the Constitution, about your gun rights, you just can't keep giving money to these people that want to take it away from you. It's It's not that difficult, folks. It might require effort on your part, and it might be uncomfortable, but you know what? Being being a slave is comfortable. It's easy to be a slave. Everyone tells you what to do, when to do it, and how to do it, and you can just be a slug and be a slave. Uh, If you want to be a free man, sometimes being a free man, being a citizen requires effort, and sometimes it's hard. It's time to be adults. It's time to step up. And be an adult and don't give money to people that want to disarm you. Sweet Buddha people, stop doing it. Now, when it comes to what can you do with yourself, your home, and your family, I like to refer back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And if you're not familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if you went to public school and they didn't teach you anything about it, you can go ahead and Google it. But essentially, every human being has basic needs. Food, water, shelter, and so forth. You can't become the CEO of a Fortune 500 company and at the same time worry about whether or not your family has enough food to eat. You have to take care of the basics. You have to take care of the fundamentals first before you can be creative, before you can you know, expand your business before you can go out and do those. And what we've got right now in the United States is we have people uh, who have subverted their the hierarchy of needs, not to themselves, but to some benevolent government agency. We have people in the United States that don't believe that it's their responsibility to make sure there's food in their own house, that that they can secure shelter for their family that they have electricity and utilities and and so forth or protection there are people in the United States that have completely abdicated the protection and safety of their families to some faceless government agency now if you're listening to the sound of my voice i'm going to assume that that's not the position you want to be in but what can you do well first of all if you want to go out and you want to pay attention to politics and you want to ensure that you're not being tr- mistreated by the public servant, if you want to spend time doing that, you need to take care of other things first. You need to make sure that there's that there's more than just uh, Taco Bell sauce packets and uh, half-empty pickle jars in your refrigerator. Walk over to your refrigerator, open up the door, and look in it. If all there is is Taco Bell sauce packets, uh, you know, Miller Lite, and uh, half a jar of pickles, you're, you're screwing up. You're doing wrong. You need to make sure, take care of your needs first. You know, when my grandmother, when I was a little kid, you know, every every spring, my mother and my grandmothers, they would plant a garden. And then every fall, they'd be in the kitchen with the pots and the jars and stuff, and they were canning food. And they would put it, we had fruit cellars, we had pantries, and we weren't rich by any stretch of the imagination. But what, you know, my, our grandparents, and if you're, you know, as old as me, your parents, what they knew was, hey, every single day, everyone in this house needs to eat. And (laughs) what would we do if there was a snowstorm? If there was a hurricane, if there was a tornado, if whatever, and we couldn't get to the grocery store for two days. If it, look at yourself in the mirror. If you couldn't get to the grocery store for two days, would your family go hungry or would you be like eating the cat? You know, 
Take care of yourself. Take care of your needs first, because when you take care of yourself, you don't have to rely upon others. You know, you, you can't go out and, and be the hero that saves the nation if your family doesn't have enough food to eat or you don't know where they're going to be living tomorrow. Take care of your health and safety and security first, and then you can go out and take care of all those other things. Now, moving on. Uh, we got another question, uh, and like, like I said last week, uh, I, the, the great thing about the student of the week is we get people involved in the show. They ask some good questions, some provocative questions, things that we want to think about, but we can't pick everyone every week as our student of the week, but we still do have some good questions. Uh, we had another one that came from our student of the gun Facebook page, and essentially, uh, if you guys uh, saw the news this week, you'll know that there was a uh, a mass stabbing, not a mass shooting, but a mass stabbing on a tex- in Houston, Texas, on a, a campus. I was the, I think it's Lone Star State College, and a guy just went bananas and just started uh, you know just started stabbing people. And one of our, uh, you know, one of our uh, fans wrote in and he said, hey, I'm a college student. You know, we talk a lot about keeping kids safe in elementary school, but I'm a college student. And what can I do to keep myself safe? Because, you know, my campus forbids me to have any kind of a defensive weapon. They forbid me to uh, even, he said, even pepper spray. They couldn't, they're not even allowed to have pepper spray uh, on the campus because we can't allow people to the tools to defend themselves because they might misuse them. Well, guess what? Bad people are always going to misuse stuff, guns, knives, whatever. You, you don't disarm the good people because there's a chance the bad people might use it. That's craziness. That's that's kindergarten mentality. I know you guys probably have friends that think like that. They're like, well, if we would just get rid of all guns. Well, first of all, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a sidetrack, Jared. Will you let me take a sidetrack? Yeah, you can take a sidetrack. I give you permission. Okay. I'm going to take a sidetrack right here. The uh, when you When you talk to your... I'm not going to say friends because I'm assuming if you're listening to this show, uh, you believe that in your right to possess arms, but acquaintances, relatives that you tolerate, those people that are like, you know, if we would just get rid of all these guns, the crime would be over. Like crime started with the invention of the firearm or murder started with the invention of the firearm. It, it's it's childish. It's this feel goodism that, well, I'm going to do something so I feel good. It doesn't actually, you know, affect any kind of a change, but I feel better. But you ask these people, be, you know, when, when you, when you encounter the next person, the next college professor or your aunt or uncle or whomever, somebody at work, and they start spouting off this, well, you know, we need to do something. We need to get rid of these guns. And you say, okay, so you think that every firearm in the United States should be secured and destroyed? And they're like, yeah, yeah. And you say to them, even the ones that the police and the government own. Well, no. Well, what do you mean? I thought you just told me that guns were the cause of crime and we have crime because there are guns. Well, no, no, no. What I mean is, is it's because people have them. Oh, oh, so you really don't believe that guns are the cause of the crime because if the guns still exist, ergo by your thinking, the crime still exists. So if gu- if there are guns, if they exist, if those pieces of aluminum and steel and wood and plastic, if if they exist in the country, We can't stop violent crime until those all go away, until we put them in a great big giant smelter and throw them in the volcano with the ring and and melt them down to nothingness, right? Well, no, it's it's okay if the government has them. So you really aren't opposed to guns like you say. You're opposed to certain people having guns. Well, yeah, you don't need that. There's no reason you can tell me that you need to have a gun. Blah, blah, blah. And they're like, okay, why does the government need to have the guns? Well, because, because of criminals, because that you don't want the government to, this police to be outgunned by criminals, do you? Well, 
so what you're telling me is you believe that a, a, a handgun or a rifle or a shotgun is an effective tool for a policeman to use to protect his life from a criminal. That's what you're telling me. Well, yeah. So why can't a citizen use that same thing to defend themselves from a criminal? Do do citizens uh, become victims of, or are they victimized by criminals? Well, yeah. All right. Uh, thanks for letting me take that sidetrack. But seriously, folks, I want you to do it. The next anti-gun knucklehead that comes up and, and spouts you, just go ahead and agree with them. Say, you know what? You're right. I think every firearm in the United States of America should be thrown into a volcano and melted down. Every one, starting with all the guns that are in the hands of government officials and see where they go. And you, they might say, yeah, you're right. <laughs> I, I kind of doubt it. But they might say, yeah, you're right. We need to roll back the clock to, you know, 1475 before gunpowder was invented. And, and uh, then there will be no rape, no robbery, no murder, because the first murder wasn't committed in, in, um, in the world until what? The invention of the firearm, right, Jared? Until the invention of the firearm, there were no suicides or murders in the world. You mean there were? What? The first murder was con committed with a stone? Well, I, I guess we need to ban stones. We need to ban rocks. <laughs> All right, moving on. Let's go back to our, our, our good friend, uh, our question about the uh, the Lone Star Campus. And he says, what can I do? Well, number one, if and, and this is the crazy thing is, we treat some adults like adults, and we treat some adults like children. If you're a good liberal Democrat and you want to talk about gun control and children and kids, kids being harmed, well, what is your stat? Well, your stats are people that are all the way up into college. So if a 21-year-old college kid is injured with a gun, you throw those in children injured by gun stats. But if you want them to vote, you give you let them vote at age 18, right, Jared? If you want them to pay taxes, you start taxing them at age 18. Uh, how many people, how many, uh, if, if you're in the audience and you're listening to me right now and you're 18, 19, or 20, how many of you think that the government shouldn't start taxing you until you can legally purchase alcohol? How about that for a concept? Say, hey, I can't buy booze because I'm not mentally mature enough at age 20 to buy booze, but you can tax my paycheck every week? Hey, Jared, were, did they tax you when you were 18, 19, and 20 years old? They've been taking money from me for about five years now. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, did anybody ever wonder why that is? Or say, well, all right, if you want to do a 21 drinking age, then the government can't start taxing me until my 21st birthday. How about that for a concept right there? Like, oh, no, 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 no. We need you young guys, you young single guys out there. We need your money. <laughs> so we treat some we treat see, treat some people like adults and some adults like children. And when it comes to college campus, uh, what do they treat you like? Well, you're you're 18, 19, 20, 21, you're on a college campus, but they treat you like a six year old that can't be trusted with scissors because you might hurt yourself. Well, number one, if you are an adult in the United States of America, what you need to do is this. You need to look at yourself in the mirror and say, how valuable is my own life? Am I responsible for protecting myself? Or is, does the responsibility lay upon someone else? If you're a little five-year-old child, you're not responsible for your own safety. Your parents are. That's their job. If you're 19 or 20 years old, are you responsible for your own safety? You say, well, yes, I am. I am responsible for my own safety. I understand that I don't carry a police officer in my back pocket. I don't have bodyguards. I don't have, you know, 24-7 security like Joe Biden and his family. I'm on my own. Well, what are you going to do? What steps are you going to take to keep yourself safe and secure? Are you going to strip yourself, you know, essentially uh, naked and just let the winds blow as they may? You have to make that decision on your own. You know, when you go to when you go to college every day, if you're, you know, when you go to class, do they make you walk through metal detectors? Do they the TSA put their fingers down your pants and, and feel your private parts? Um, you know, if they do, you're probably just going to have to, you know, 
do what they say. There are ways to protect yourself. There are things that you can use as uh, tools in what we call non-permissive environments. Now, I'm not really going to get into too many of those here uh, on the radio, but what you can do, what you really should do is you should follow Student of the Gun TV and you should watch the shows because, you know, several uh, we've done several segments and episodes about uh, justifiable use of force and different levels of force, uh, whether it's using a flashlight or a pen or, you know, pepper spray or a knife or what have you. Uh, we, we cover that in detail uh, in Student of the Gun, on Student of the Gun, on the show, in the archives and what have you. So pay attention to that. But the big question for you, as if you're a college student, you have to ask yourself, what is my life worth, and am I responsible for protecting myself, or am I not? And if you go to, you know, and as you grow and become an adult, when you go to work for some, for a company, or you work for an agency, or you go into a building or whatever, and they disarm you, when someone tells you that you have to be disarmed for reasons of safety... You need to ask yourself, whose safety are they concerned with? Are they concerned with my safety or are they concerned with the safety of bad people? So I guess the answer to the question is, what can I do as a, uh, a college student to protect myself? Is You need to, A, educate yourself. What can I do? What can you, what can you legitimately physically do? Uh, can you fight against a person with a an exacto knife who's attacking you with your hands and if you do you expect to be cut uh, what is the best way to stop a person with a knife jared with a gun exactly with a gun uh when people bring knives to gunfights they generally lose uh not all the time ask doc holiday but generally when you bring a knife to a gunfight you lose when you bring a gun to a gunfight uh, it can be a a 50 50 tie depending on who's got the most motivation but when the guy's running around and that's what we have to ask ourselves with the after this texas uh and you you don't don't expect that uh, your good liberal friends are going to change their minds about this but you have to ask yourself all right so we're in a we're in a weapon free zone no weapons allowed on campus and because we have shiny signs all over campus, that keeps us safe, right? Yeah, when you're a six-year-old, when you have the mentality of a kindergartner, that does. And anybody who thinks that shiny signs and placards that say no weapons allowed on campus and or that's the, that's the school policy. Oh, so bad people won't bring weapons on campus and, and attack people, will they? No, of course they won't because they respect the shiny plastic signs. You have to take care of yourself, whether it's with a flashlight or a pocket knife or a can of pepper spray or a taser or a gun, what have you. You need to figure out what is my life worth. And, you know, we were talking a little bit uh, earlier off uh, off air. And the, 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 <laughs> I don't know if I should say this, Jared, but you know what? When I say I don't know if I should say this, what have I already made the decision to do? Say it. <laughs> you know who are the worst offenders at this? Um, li- liberal men and, or emasculated men and women. Uh, because, well, I can't carry a gun to my work or I can't carry any kind of a weapon at work because in the uh, policy it says no weapons are allowed at my place of business. I say, okay, fantastic. Uh, so you when and if I if they catch me, I'll lose my job. Would you rather lose your job or lose your life? Would you rather lose your job or be raped in the parking lot? Well, well, I probably won't get raped. Well, okay. If you want to live your life on probablys, go ahead and live your life on probablys. But uh, guys out there, you know what I'm talking about. The people that are they're more concerned with not breaking a statutory or a a uh, internal policy rule than they are concerned with being, you know assaulted, raped, robbed, what have you, you know, and, and I guess it's, it's a little bit of human nature because people don't like to think about bad things. They just want to whistle past the graveyard, you know, I'll whistle past the graveyard. Everything will probably be okay. 
Well, if you're an adult and you've accepted the fact that bad things can and do happen to good people, your next question is, what can I do to protect myself? And that's what we're all about here at Student of the Gun is enabling you to protect yourself, assisting you in being a secure human being and securing yourself and your family. Now, moving on. Oh, this is a good note. Uh, We talked a little bit about the NRA's ILA, Institute for Legislative Action. And uh, if you're listening and you're an NRA member, you probably are aware that the NRA annual meeting is coming up. And every year for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, the NRA hosts an annual meeting. And they move it all around the country so that depending on your West Coast, East Coast, North, South, what have you, you have the opportunity to attend one. And this year, it's going to be in Houston, Texas. It's going to be the 3rd uh, through the 5th of May. The th- May 3rd, 4th, and 5th in Houston, Texas is the NRA's annual meeting. And I think a lot of you uh, out there in the radio listening world are uh, maybe planning to go. Well, the good news is Student of the Gun is going to be there. Yes, I know you're relieved uh, to know that. But we will be there. As a matter of fact, uh, most all the people on the Firearms Radio Network, uh, all the, the show hosts on FRN, are going to be there, and there's going to be a an FRN, what did uh, Jake, the producer, call it, uh, fan appreciation night or fan get-together on Saturday night. And uh, if you uh, watch, if you pay attention to the FRN uh, uh, home sites and websites, you'll uh, there's going to be postings about where the fan get-together is going to be. Aha, my faithful studio engineer, Jared, just put the uh, exact time and location up on my monitor. So if you want to join us for the Firearms Radio Network listener meetup at the NRA show, it's going to be Saturday, May 4th at 8 p.m. at Lucky's Pub. Now, Lucky's Pub is located at 801 St. Emanuel Street in Houston, Texas. And I've been told it is walking distance from the convention center. So, again, if you want to uh, meet up with us, uh, for Firearms Radio Network, you know, if you do a fan appreciation, uh, I'm not buying your beer, by the way. Uh, I don't know who's buying your beer, but it's not going to be me. I love you, but I'm not buying all of your beer. <laughs> now, uh, at the NRA annual meetings, uh, during the, during the show on the floor, Student of the Gun is going to be there. And we're actually going to be doing a book signing at several different booths. We're going to be at the Duracoat booth the Excess Sites booth, the Keltec booth, and the Kiapa booth. Now, if you're looking at your list, Duracoat isn't listed because they're sharing a booth with DS Arms. So you can go to the DS Arms booth. You guys can check it out. Uh, we're going to have postings up uh, on our website. And if you're not following Student of the Gun on Facebook, well, well, why aren't you? Why have you not done that yet? But if you do that, we're going to put the every day's book signing. We'll go ahead and put that up there. We'd love to see you guys. Uh, if you can make it, fantastic. If you can't, uh, we'll be there with you in spirit. But we'd love to see you guys if you can make it out to the NRA show. And that's only, what, two weeks away, Jared? About two weeks from now. So uh, we're looking forward to it. We're looking forward to, to meeting and greeting and, and seeing a lot of you folks uh, out there. Now, the last subject we want to talk about today, uh, it's, it, we're back on serious subject, but you know what? This is, these are serious times that we live in. And that's probably why you're listening to me today is because you understand and you realize that these are serious times that we live in. And right now in the United States of America, we are armed citizens or we have the ability to be armed citizens. And there are two ways historically to defeat an armed citizenry. You can either do it physically by just sending out the troops and disarming the people manually. You can do that. It's been done historically. They've sent the troops out into the uh, countryside and disarmed the peasants, taking their swords and bows and lances and guns and what have you. Uh, The British were really good at doing that when they were an empire. They did it in India. They did it in Scotland, Ireland, you name it. Uh, They were real good at disarming the peasantry. The Japanese have done it. It's been done all over the world. Well, I I think that uh, all of you believe that right now in the United States, if they tried to do that, if they mobilized the U.S. Army or whomever and just marched down the street going to people's houses to take their guns tomorrow, there would be a problem. There would be a problem with that. Well, they don't want to have to do that because that would be difficult and it would be, uh, you know, we, these people still have to be voted for right now uh, and, until the uh, the liberals fix the system so that they don't require votes anymore to be in charge. Uh, they can't do that. Well, how do you disarm an armed citizenry? 
How do you defeat the armed citizen without actually physically coming to his home with troops and taking his guns? Well, there's three ways. There's through ignorance, distraction, and guilt. Now, ignorance doesn't mean being stupid. It just means not being aware of your rights or of history. And how do we do that? Well, that process has been underway for, what, 30, 40 years or more in our public school systems as they have, you know, decayed and declined decade after decade, where we remove science and math and history We take those away. Those are no longer important. Now what do we have in public schools? Public schools have essentially become uh, liberal indoctrination centers. And if you don't believe me, you're fooling yourself and you haven't been to a public school lately. If you don't have kids in public schools, fantastic. But if you do, you probably know what I'm saying. You're probably a very frustrated person. You ask your kids, what did you do today? Oh, we had an Earth Day assembly. What? What? Yeah, we had a a special Earth Day assembly. So we don't have enough time in the day to teach you history and social studies and, uh, you know, math and science. But we can spend an hour and a half in the gym talking about hugging trees. That's not what public schools are for. That's not what a school is for. If you want to talk about hugging trees, talk about hugging trees in the comfort of your own home. No, no, no. We have to do that in schools. Uh, We have to – we're worried about – unsubstantiated or fragile self-esteem. We can't give kids failing grades because that'll hurt their self-esteem. Yeah, but the kid didn't do the work. Yeah, well, but he tried or he wanted to. What? What we've done is we've essentially, we've dumbed down our education system, and I don't need to remind you of that, but it's a fact. And that is one of the ways that you defeat an armed citizenry is you dumb them down from the word go so they don't even know what their rights are. They don't under, you know how many people in the United States don't understand the Bill of Rights? That they think their rights come from some benevolent government agency? Well, why would they think that? Well, because they've never been taught any better. So number one, keep people ignorant. And the next one is distraction. Now, there's two types of distraction. There's your typical Hollywood, you know, trash. There's the sewage that flows out of the, uh, of the studios in Hollywood, whether it's on television or in the movies or, you know, in the form of popular music. The filth and the sewage that flows out of there to distract you. Whether it's Dancing with the Stars, or I, you know, I harp on that a lot, but uh, and I don't watch it, or American American Idiot, or what's that show called, Jared? American American Idol. Oh, okay, American Idol. What I was I was close, Uh, just to keep you distracted so that you're fat and happy and watching the idiot box. You've got that kind of distraction going on. Now, there are some people in the United States that are stubbornly clinging to, uh, you know, the Constitution. And, uh, you know, we, we need to figure out a way to distract those people. So if you can't distract them with the vapid Hollywood garbage, what you can distract them with is things like global warming or gay rights or whatever is going on today. How many people that are that you know are pro-gun, pro-Constitution, pro-Second Amendment, and so forth, but you argue with each other over things like gay marriage or global warming or environmental this and environmental that. And why, what do you, why do you think those things are put front and center uh, in the newspapers, on the evening news shows, on your social media, on your digital media, your, you know, you're reading Fox News on the, why do you think those things are put forth? Well, while you're paying attention to that, while you're arguing with your friends over the legitimacy or non-legitimacy of gay rights or global warming or whatever, what else is going on in the world? What else is going on in Washington, D.C.? What are they doing that you're not paying attention to? That is a distraction. Human beings only have so much energy and so much attention. And, you know, we already talked about most adults right now have the attention span of a housefly. And that didn't happen overnight. So you've got ignorance. You've got distraction. And what's the last one? Well, the last one is guilt. All right. They figured, well, okay, this person somehow accidentally became educated. All right, we can't stop that. Um, and they're not falling for our distractions. 
they're still paying attention to what's going on and what we're doing. Well, how can we get the guns out of their hands? Aha, guilt will guilt them away. Well, how do you do that? Well, let me see. You could have um, the Justice Department funnel thousands of guns directly into the hands of Mexican gun cartel or drug cartels. Well, they would never do that, would they? Oh, it's already been done. And then why, why do we do that? Why do you think that the United States government deliberately funneled guns into the hands of Mexican drug cartels? Did they really, really, really think they were going to drive into Mexico and make all these arrests? Am I, uh, hey, Jared, while I'm talking, can you look up the title of Mike Deddy's book? Can you do that? Uh, a, a good friend of mine, a man named Mike Deddy. Mike Deddy is, uh, well, he's, he's a Marine. He was a Marine officer. And uh, Mike is a uh, federal firearms dealer. He has an FFL, and he lives in Arizona. Well, my good friend Mike uh, accidentally became directly involved in the whole Fast and Furious deal when the ATF approached him and said, hey, FFL holder, this is what we're going to do, and this is what we need to do. And Mike, you know, being a good American patriot, Mike thought, okay, these guys are going to do some good. They're actually going to start busting these cartels and the gun runners. Well, it didn't happen. And we're not supposed, you're not supposed to pay attention to that. You're not supposed to know. But yeah, ask yourself, why would we do that? Why would our government legitimately, why would they, you know, let guns go to people that shouldn't have them. Um, Jared just pulled up the uh, the title of Mike's book right now. I'm going to go ahead. And uh, his his name is Mike Deddy. That's Delta Echo Tango Tango Yankee, Mike Deddy. And he's the author of a brand new book that's coming out called Guns Across the Border. And that's his in-depth experience as an FFL dealer who is involved and approached and, and recruited by the ATF to basically – you know, walk guns, get, make sure that people who should not have gotten guns got them. They knew that the cartels were buying those guns and they were taking them back to Mexico. And they just greenlit it and they told them, let them go, we'll get them later. Well, they never did. And Mike's book, uh, Guns Guns Across the Border, uh, I don't know if it's available right now. It may be available in pre-order. Uh, you might be able to pre-order it. I believe it's coming out in, in May. It's going to be released nationally in May. And I can't imagine that the current administration is going to appreciate that. But t- there are three ways to disarm an armed citizenry or to defeat an armed citizenry. And keep these in mind because brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, whether you know it or not, whether you want to acknowledge it or not, every single day there is a war going on for your soul. There, there is a war going on for your soul. There is a battle for control of your soul. Whether you believe it or not, whether you acknowledge it or not, doesn't mean it's not happening. And how do we defeat an armed citizenry? We do that by keeping them ignorant. If we can't keep them ignorant, we'll distract them. And things that you might not believe are distractions, things that you think are really, really important. You need to ask yourself, when uh, there's a lead story on CNN, you shouldn't be watching CNN anyway, unless just you just want to see what the enemy's up to. But uh, if the lead story on, on your paper, you have to ask yourself, am I supposed to pay attention to that so I'll be distracted? Am I supposed to argue with my fellow patriots, my fellow citizens about that so I'm not paying attention to something else? And then what's the last one? Guilt. Why do we do Fast and Furious? Was it to guilt the American gun owner into accepting more and more restrictions on their rights? Well, they got caught with egg on their face in that one, so what do we do? Well, every time there is a shooting in the United States, we get 24-hour-a-day, nonstop, incessant coverage of that shooting. You know, you live in Texas or California or Montana or whatever, and you can't turn on a television and not hear about the shooting in Connecticut or in Colorado or what have you. Why do they do that? Because you're supposed to feel bad. You, the American gun owner who never hurt a fly, who is an upstanding citizen who pays their taxes and lawfully owns firearms, you're supposed to feel guilty. And you're supposed to just go ahead and accept more restrictions on your liberties because someone committed a crime. 
Well, folks, that's about it for this week. Uh, we want to remember and thank and appreciate all of our sponsors, Keltec Firearms of Cocoa, Florida, and also Crossbreed Holsters of Republic, Missouri. And both of those guys, you can check them out uh, on their websites. You can check out uh, crossbreedholsters.com very easy, or keltechweapons.com. Check them out. If you are in, uh, we got one more show, but I think we got one more show before NRA, and we're going to be recording a show uh, before, uh, actually while we get there, we're going to be recording a student of the gun from the floor of the NRA annual meetings. We'll remind you about that. But uh, if you have the opportunity to go down to Houston, uh, we'd very much appreciate it if you come by and say hello, check us out. Remember, you're a beginner once, but you should be a student for life.